Hello again out there. I've decided I'd do a little bit of a throwback appearance today, and we'll talk about the US M1A2 non-combatant gas mask. This was issued in the early days of US involvement in World War II, and was kind of an emergency expedient device. And it may be a little bit more interesting because of that, because it kind of disappeared pretty quickly after the war as uh, there was no need for that kind of device anymore and people that had them pretty much discarded them or they ended up in a bit more unique circumstance which I'll show you at the end of this. <clears throat> but to get going, most people are probably pretty familiar with that during World War I chemical weapons were widely used by both sides in the war and after the war there were a number of treaties to regulate their use but I don't think anybody was too certain that uh, those treaties would be followed and respected. And when World War II started in 1939, people were rightly concerned about gas warfare making a reappearance. Along with the rise of aviation, too, between the wars, it had been predicted that there would be bombing raids on civilian population centers, and certainly the history of World War II bore that out as a fact. Mixed in with that concern, though, is that besides these bombing raids with conventional explosive and or incendiary devices, that attackers might well mix gas bombs into the mix, too. Primarily, probably things like mustard or lewisite or their other derivatives, because besides causing casualties and panic, Mustard is pretty persistent and nasty to clean up, so it's dangerous for a while, it can cause casualties, and it hampers recovery efforts. So, prior and immediately upon the outbreak of World War II, particularly in Germany and England, the governments there issued civilians living in major population centers with gas masks and when there was an air raid, besides heading to your shelter with your family, you'd have to grab your gas mask and don your gas masks while you were in your shelter and wait for the all clear of the air raid. After the first few months of the war, that became less likely and less of a concern. But when the U.S. entered the war in 1941, and things really got going in 1942, a civil defense program was implemented here, and among other things, that considered the possibility of air raids and gas warfare, no matter how unlikely that may seem. In some ways, it was probably more of an effort just to give people something to do and be occupied with a war effort, and maybe a little bit of training that might be useful with something in the future as opposed to a practical outright possibility. But nevertheless, besides for soldiers, the U.S. did make an effort to provide some of the civilian population and civil defense forces in particular with gas masks, especially those in coastal areas that were felt to be the most vulnerable to some kind of attack. And the M1A2 in particular, as the name would suggest, was a slightly later derivative of some other masks that were tried first. And as we can uh, take a look at it here, we can see that it's a pretty simple design. Uh, there's nothing fancy about it, just a face piece with a canister and a uh, six strap head harness. We'll show you some detail pictures, but there's no nasal cup inside or anything, so these would have been quite prone to fogging. The material it's made out of is kind of a rubberized, heavy leather-like fabric. Some earlier versions experimented with either the fabric or rubber itself, but as rubber was a strategic material, at the time for many things besides uh, gas masks, especially civilian ones, a compromise was necessary and ultimately, <clears throat> excuse me, this uh, rubber power, rubber covered version was uh, produced and issued as a standard item. 
Something like over 6 million of these were made during World War II for the U.S. in a number of sizes for adults, and there were also children's versions too. The main features you might have noticed that the eyepieces <clears throat> have gone kind of yellow on this, and that's very common on these. The plastics were like a celluloid-based material at the time, and over the years they are prone to yellowing. The other feature of this mask that may not be readily apparent is that the canister on it here is permanently attached to the mask. The entire thing was considered a throwaway disposable type item. You'd use it if necessary, and then you'd have to get another one if you needed it again. So I am going to put it on and we'll wear it for a moment here. I would not generally recommend that long term. It's both old and it's another case of who knows what the heck is inside these filters. And at any rate, certainly it won't give you much, if any, in the way of protection from anything these days. So we'll show it to you on, but I'm not going to leave it on for very long. It may also be kind of noisy too, as it has a single exhalation valve on the side here, and it tends to rattle a lot, so expect some noise. Now let's do our best to get it on here. All right, we got it on. You may actually be able to hear me. Well, we kind of got a seal. That's good enough for this test. And given that you don't know what's in the filter, maybe not having a good seal is a good thing. That's not uncomfortable. But like I said, without that cup inside the mask, these windows would be very prone to fogging. And you can hear the exhalation valve is pretty noisy. Sets of these were usually issued. They came in a cardboard box. And inside the box there would be the mask, an instruction sheet, and a carrier bag like this one. And as you can see, it has the U.S. and the Chemical Corps markings on it in the non-combatant death gas mask designation. And of course, that it's property of the U.S. government also. Many of these sets were issued during the war and were basically surplus immediately after it. And they were replaced by other designs and some enterprising individuals got it, bought up the surplus masks and sold them to kids in the back of comic books and magazines as a toy or play item. I'll try to stick one of those ads as a still in here so you can see what it looks like. Also, to complete the rig here, I have also an authentic World War II era civil defense steel pot helmet. When the war broke out, civil defense was generally issued uh, World War I style Brody tin hat helmets that were painted white. The supply of those ran out quickly. And the new M1 steel pot helmet was needed for service members going overseas to combat zones. So this helmet design was uh, rapidly put into production. And they're still not too hard to find today. Usually they would be either plain white or you might have the Civil Defense logo still on the front of it.
or a, they had an extensive system of branch of service logos too. Among other things like uh, search and rescue, air raid, warden, gas warfare, decontamination, and that symbol might appear on the front, or nothing at all. But there you go, now we have an authentic uh, World War II era civil defense appearance with our helmet and gas mask here. So we're ready to do our air raid, warden, or decontamination duties. As I said, these were sold to children after the war, so they're still fairly common and not that difficult to find on the auction sites, places like eBay and whatnot. You'll see these turn up fairly regularly in various conditions and sizes. A face piece material, though, is prone to setting and position. Like you can see, this one has a bulge on the chin area here. And besides that, the canisters were prone to rusting on the front of it, so you might find a rusty canister. And of course, almost all of the eyepieces will have turned various shades of yellow by now. So that's pretty much expected. But you can find anything from a rusted out mask alone to full sets with a bag, instructions, and cardboard box at corresponding price levels, but even then, they're still not terribly expensive. And I think they make an interesting World War II collectible. And it's a look back at another era, where, as I said, uh, there was at least a significant fear that there would be gas attacks involved with air raids as well. Unfortunately, while that didn't come to pass, there were still preparations made for it here, even in the United States. So hopefully you enjoyed this brief look at the M1A2 non-combatant gas mask as issued by the United States during World War II. And maybe next time we'll be back with something more modern. Thanks for watching.